Hello to Timmy. Um, I was there two years ago for this equivalent event and uh, I'm glad to participate in, in this event today. And thank you to Faith and Laura for moderating. And also to Mr. Sharif for his very uh, stimulating talk. I'm going to be slightly controversial, I'm afraid. As an academic, this is what we do. We try and challenge these accepted uh, wisdoms. And uh, Khalid made, uh, I think he said, high fives, right? And before I start, I think I would just point out that while he's right in saying that, you know, African economies are leading in terms of growth, but not in terms of growth per capita, there is a, a long standing relationship in economics, which is not a very pleasant thing to say, which is, and it's, it's developed from work done by a Nobel Prize winning economist, Simon, the Kuznets curve, which depicts a relationship between growth and inequality as an inverse view relationship. In other words, without being too technical, in the early stages of periods of economic growth, historically speaking, this happened in the UK, it happened in America, it happened across Europe. I'm afraid, uh, and this is the unpleasant thing to say, that there is a rising level of inequality as well. Uh, and this is measured by things like Gini coefficients, with, which Khalid mentioned. Now, this is sometimes called the, the iron law, one of the iron laws of economics. Economics has been described as a dismal science because we're always talking about the negative aspects of this. This doesn't mean, of course, and here I agree with Khalid that that relationship, that inverse U relationship cannot be mitigated. It can. And indeed, you can get different shapes of this curve for different countries. And some countries have achieved great success in mitigating the inequality effects of economic growth. So I wanted just to start with that, with, with that comment. That, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm a trickle-down economist, by the way. I think I'd probably describe myself as a Keynesian economist. Um, Keynes, of course, saw the value of both the public sector and the private sector in stimulating uh, economic growth. But in relation to Africa particularly, I thought, I thought what uh, Khalid said in terms of the, the high fives was very, very useful in, in terms of structuring, of course, this two-day event that you're, that you're going to have. And I want to just go through them one by one because I think that might help. In terms of, I'll, I'll go to the industrialization point first because I think he's absolutely right in this regard. You know, a Africa, is the source of most of the raw materials of the world. And he, he enumerated there whether it's cocoa, whether it's diamonds, whether it's um, uh, cotton and so on, and coffee. And, and I think the conundrum for Africa, for most African countries is to, to industrialize uh, or at least to engage in what some people call agro-industry activities. And he's right in saying that the challenge is to improve the value chain in, in that process. That, that is not easy. That is not easy. I thought he was a little bit too negative, I must say, um, in what he said about value change. Now, I, I wouldn't contest with what he said in terms of 800 to 1,000% of the value chain is generated outside Africa. I, I, I would not be able to to contest that. But, but I do think there are some success stories in uh, dealing with this problem. I mean, I, I know West Africa quite well, and I know that uh, there, is, there is a growing internal market for the production of, of, cho of, of um, chocolate, for example, from cocoa. So I, I think there was, we need a bit more balanced and nuanced understanding of these relationships. And I'm always very reluctant, and I was pleased that he also displayed this reluctance not to generalize across 54 countries because they're all very different. So that's my first point. And I think I think I sort of agree with him, but I'd like to kind of put a more subtle, subtle perspective on that. The second point is, and here I, here I do agree with him, that what all economies need is an expanding middle class a middle class of the population who spend, and here I totally agree with him on that, 
And this, this is the challenge. But how do you generate that middle class? How do you, how do you encourage it? And again, some, some countries are doing quite rather well in this area. Nigeria is one of them, actually, uh, that has a very expanding, uh, rapidly expanding uh, number of people that we would call middle class, i.e. Uh, using purchasing power parity equivalents on income levels uh, somewhat comparable to income levels in parts of Europe, for example. And this, this is also applying to countries like Kenya and Ghana to some extent. So I think a growing middle class is, is extremely important because he's right in saying that without consumption, you don't get the demand for labor. The third point where I also sort of agree with him, but I would just suggest a possible way out of this dilemma that he identified and that is in terms of uh, state investment in industry and so on. Now the question is, and the problem is, the tax base in many African countries is too low to achieve that from internal resources. Now, this leads to two or three outcomes, and one of them is a reliance on inward investment. I must, I'm sorry to say. And, and in recent years, a lot of that inward investment has derived from obviously countries like China, and uh, that raises issues about what terms and conditions for that uh, FDI uh, uh, exist. I have a number of doctoral students working on this at the moment. And this is a very, very difficult area to, to develop, uh, to, to, to move away from. So when the tax base is low, state investment is difficult to achieve from internal, internal resources. I was very interested in what uh, uh, Knox said just a few minutes ago uh, uh, about the, the role of the diaspora in this regard, because an increasing number of African countries are actually trying to, re to mitigate this reliance on FDI by inward remittances from diaspora populations abroad. And this is, uh, this is evident in a, a number of cases. And I'll just mention one case which I'm particularly familiar with, which is in Ethiopia, uh, and this is a controversial point again, because uh, Khalid did mention the importance of power generation. In Ethiopia, of course, there's a major dam project, the GERD project, which is very controversial because there are disputes about between Egypt and, and Ethiopia, uh, and Sudan is involved as well in terms of the effects upstream on the Nile. And that dam has been built mainly by uh, internally generated revenues from the Ethiopian economy and remittances from Ethiopians, the large diasporan population that live across the world. So I think, I think the debate has to move on a little bit from just, is it private sector or public sector? It's a whole mix of different components, just like a good meal. My fourth point, I think, uh, is that the, the role of aid, you know, is the, the old question that we've been debating in development for literally decades. And, you know, I actually Knox just mentioned the point that just a few days ago, the UK has decided to reduce its aid to GDP ratio from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5. Now, we know this is to do with COVID. I actually take the view, and people might not like me saying this, that this is probably a good thing for Africa. Because we, t we keep talking about dependency, but when it comes to difficult decisions, we shy away from them. And here we have a decision made by Britain, which many British politicians have objected to, by the way, which we can live with, and we'll have to live with it. And it's probably a good thing in my opinion, because when it comes to aid uh, from government to government, there we have the problem of monitoring that aid, making sure the aid is spent on what it should be spent, opportunities for rent seeking and corruption and so on and so on. And, and I'm sorry, there is a lot of evidence that this goes on in Africa. I've worked in Africa, in and on Africa for more than 40 years. I'm not saying Africans are more corrupt than non-Africans, by the way, <laughs> just to be careful on that point. And this takes me to my last point, which uh, I was surprised that Kelly did not mention. I know he was uh, pushed push for time. And that is the role of institutions 
within African economies. And this is spread across most of the continent Africa, in Africa with some exceptions. There was a, an election this week in Burkina Faso, and there's one in Ghana soon. And of course, there are events going on in Ethiopia as we speak. And one of the major obstacles to sustainable economic growth in Africa uh, is the, the weak institutions, political institutions, uh, the fact that often the economy is doing very well and then an election comes along and there is, uh, there is trouble and uh, demonstrations and sometimes violence and so on, and it sets the economy back again by a few years. So what's the solution to that? Well, in the UK, if we look at the UK situation, I, I won't refer to the American situation, the recent American election, because I think that's a bit of an outlier when it comes to this point that I'm about to make, which is we have very peaceful elections. And the reason for this, one of the reasons for this is we have a stable civil service. So when there's a new party comes into power in the UK, the civil service remains the same. So there's not a, a great turnover of staff in the civil service, but in Africa, in most African countries, at least that I'm familiar with, this is not the case. Uh, and so people's jobs are at stake when a new party is elected. This is why there is often a lot of trouble at election time. And it, it might seem a rather trivial point to make, but it's far from trivial. Because as Khalid said, here we have a continent that has been growing at a very fast rate, but then it's set back again. It's sometimes, as we say, one step forward and two steps back. So I think I'll end on that particular point, which does sound a bit pessimistic, but it can be dealt with. There are many, many other points that one could make about the impact, for example, and the lead that Africa has taken in things like mobile money, particularly in countries like Kenya, which has allowed uh, entrepreneurship and the payments or payment systems to work smoothly, which we could talk about at length, but of course time, time is limited. So I hope I have been sufficiently controversial, uh, but not too controversial. Um, this is an ongoing process and all of us in this room, this Zoom room, uh, want to see Africa develop and develop its middle class so that one day, quite soon, African countries will be providing aid to other parts of the world. Thank you very much. A lot has been said and I just want in a very short and, and brief manner for you to, uh, to give your parting shots here before we close the session. I remain... I mean, I totally agree with Khalid when he talks about the need to reassess the GDP measure. Um, this is true across the world, actually, but it's particularly true in Africa. How we do that uh, is, a, is another question. And I think to some extent, that has to involve the formalization of the informal sector. There is no other way of doing it. So, I mean, I, I remember supervising a student's thesis many years ago, a Brazilian student, and they, they had a huge informal sector and they ended up taxing it successfully. And the, the role of tax, tax collecting, while it might sound punitive, is actually, a, it focuses the minds of people within the informal sector. How that's actually done across the African continent is a whole subject in its, in, in its own right. But I was very impressed by what Khalid said on that, on that matter. Just, just one other point, I think, which I would comment on, which is that we are seeing success in the area of what Khalid was talking about in terms of reducing the level of dependency on just a small number of commodities. I think you mentioned a group of countries where they were dependent on three commodities in each of these countries. And I know I do quite a bit of work on Ethiopia and that, that's been quite successful in Ethiopia. At one time, about 10, 15 years ago, 60 odd percent of its foreign exchange earnings came from coffee. And now it's down to 40 odd percent. That's a good thing, you know, that means the the country's diversifying its export base and its foreign exchange base, partly through uh, 
the industrialization process that Khalid was also talking about because Ethiopia is a country that has uh, developed uh, clusters, of industrial parks that allow them to specialize in, in a whole range of different commodities. One of the reasons why their growth rate has, has been quite high. So th these are the comments I would make, uh, Faith, just to, to conclude this uh, session. Thank you.